So, Q&A now. Anybody, any questions? Sir. Thank you for uh, your time today. I was interested in the idea that uh, a competent tyrant with clear vision, I, I get the clear vision, everybody organizes too. Where do you teach in the culture feedback for if there's gotta be such a strong vision and lack of democracy in the decision making? How do you encourage the, the people with the clear vision to accept even contradictory views that may be very helpful to them? Well, I think, look, I think that uh, it starts with the idea that not every idea is a good idea. And so, you know, the scarcest resource we have in our lives today is time. And the second scarcest, you know, concept is opportunity cost. And so, you know, to have a unlimited discussion, to have nobody sort of uh, setting up the guide rails, uh, you can waste an enormous amount of time. And so even some of the best ideas are not necessarily the ideas that you can move forward on. Uh, I think our process is one of argument. And so uh, we literally want people to sort of assert themselves and everything else. But when the arguments are over, we want everybody to sign up for the program and move forward. So, and this is this idea of, you know, we don't want commitments in words alone. We don't want people just saying that they're going to do things or sign up for the program and then not really committing to do it because that's very destructive of the energy and everything else. So we're, we're remarkably open. We're not very polite to architects on the whole, but as a general proposition, well, and I'll tell you why, I'll tell you a very simple idea, which grew out of the practice of architecture for a zillion years. And that is that uh, the best architects only show up once a week to a project. And their position is, if it's not right, I'll tell the contractor to do it over, okay? We show up every single day because we want to prevent the mistakes. And the difference is if you tell the contractor two or three times to do it over, about the third time, he's like, well, there's all my profit in the job. I'm going somewhere else. And so that strategy of supervision doesn't work. It doesn't work if you're the owner, if you're the people that are committed to the success of the project because you can't afford it. And so that's a, that's a typical one of these situations where, sure, we have conversations, we understand what the architects are trying to accomplish, but the day-to-day -day responsibility of building and executing whatever it is falls on us. And it's not something you can delegate and it's not something that you don't do. And, and one of the things that you discover when you're on site in, a, in a, a construction mode or any creative mode, you discover that the people who are executing it pick up on that energy too. And we literally have cases all the time because we built 800,000 square feet of space in the last 10 years in Chicago. We have cases all the time where the contractors employees say they wanted us to get off and do this other job. We're going to stay and finish this job for now. And the reason is they understand that this is important personally to us, that we're more committed than the guy who's building a retail space down the street who could give a shit about when it's done or how it's done. And that's contagious. And so commitment really to us means that you live it every day and you prove it every day and you demonstrate it every day. And when you do that, everybody else sort of signs up for the dream. So, sir. Hey, thank you again for your time. Um, so you talk about how you have to expect nothing less than great quality from the people you're working with and how you know, you have to pick or you can't pick between, you know, a timely service and a quality product. How do you enforce that type of mindset, especially when you're dependent on partners who you might need for, you know, products or, or service and they might not be meeting the type of quality that you, you know, would expect? I, the first message is that every job is important and that every every single job from the you know most junior job in the organization to the uh, senior jobs in the organization is important and it can either be done 100% right or it can be done in degrading you know, degrees. And if people believe that, if they believe that their contribution is really important, I mean, we had a business we built and they had 6,000 inventory takers across the United States. And in the winter, going outside and taking inventory was ugly and cold and everything else. The whole system depended on them paying attention and doing their job. 
And we needed to make it clear to them that the foundation of the entire business was them scraping off the ice on a window, them doing the inspections. And yeah, there are some people who are going to disappoint you, but you always have to sort of raise the average. You know, you have to sort of constantly look for the people that this is meaningful to, and you need to make their jobs meaningful. If you look down on these jobs, you know, we in the United States now, we look down on vocational training. The truth is, these are the some of the best jobs for a middle class income these days because they're not exportable and they're real jobs. And so we're going to have to change that too. But uh, we don't think there are unimportant jobs. We just think there are people who aren't motivated. Thank you. Yeah, please. So uh, this seems to be a good follow on question. Actually, you mentioned that it's important when you set up an organization to make sure that everyone's bought in and feels valued. I wonder if you can share your point of view on uh, startup formation, ownership and equity models, which uh, at least out West are really biased toward the first um, two or three people, the product development function and ideas in general. Yeah, I think that um, there are a lot of things <clears throat> in the formation of startups that are works in, in progress and that are gonna have to change. Certainly the concentration, I mean, the fantasy that the first four people in the garage are each going to own 25% of the business in perpetuity. Um, that's not realistic. That's not what's happening. I think that uh, the job of the investors, the job of the advisors is to make it clear to the entrepreneurs that, that nothing gets done these days by one person. Nothing gets done by something that isn't a team that takes into account a lot of different skills and a lot of different capabilities. And so um, sharing the wealth and distributing the responsibility and the sort of the upside is something that's much more a prevalent sort of uh, behavior in the Midwest than it is on either of the coasts. So it's not as big an issue here. The, the bigger issue here is we have, a lot of, we have a lot of companies fail. I won't be electrocuted at least. We have a lot of companies that fail for a very interesting reason. They have a different fantasy that doesn't work in the real world. And the fantasy has to do with sales. And here's how the fantasy progresses. There is a person, maybe the second most important person that you hire in your business, who's, na who's called the sales manager. And the sales manager's job is to fire people every few weeks. And so he or she is not the most welcome person at the TGIF on Fridays. Uh, nor does he get invited to the bowling parties. And kumbaya is not really part of his vocabulary or her vocabulary. Now, if they don't do their job, the business fails. So, you know, when you're building a business, you have to understand that there are all these different functions and different kinds of people are capable of doing those things, but they're all working toward the common interest. That's a, So this idea that everybody is employable and everybody is going to be part of the thing that really doesn't work either. So we not only are sort of fierce and unrelenting on what companies we think are uh, going to progress and proceed, but also on individuals. If they're not really adding and if they're not really going to be successful, we think they would be better served to be somewhere else. Either way. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> so I have a question for you, especially in um, dealing with creatives and in a creative environment where um, genuine inspiration and genuine um, creativity, I guess, is so essential to the business model, how do you balance allowing space for that with this, as you say, fierce, unrelenting, tyrannical, you know, dictatorial? How do you balance those two things? Because they seem, in my experience in the field for coming up on 10 years and a lot of different firms, they seem a little mutually exclusive to me. They're not mutually exclusive because we love and we're super excited about great ideas. And so I, no one is a bigger advocate of a new idea or a different idea or a creative idea than I am. No one. Everybody else says we can't afford it or we can't do it. And I'm like, no, we're doing it in spades because this is part of the culture too. So um, I think the truth is when I say all the time, make room for people, that's exactly the design. It's to make room for people who, you know, a lot of people don't, they're not crazy neurotic entrepreneurs. So they want to have a job and they want to do something and then they want to go home because they also want to have a family who knew and they mm -hmm. want to do these other kinds of things. And so 
you have to build an organization that is capable of letting people live their lives and make their contributions. And this is, you know, there was a bank robber named Willie Sutton. And, you know, his famous quote was when they asked him why he robs banks, he said, that's where the money is. It made a lot of sense. But his second observation was about his team of robbers. And he said, you know, they don't have to love each other. They just have to each do their job as well as they can do it. And that's how you make room for people. You you look at each person and you measure them against the best that they can be. And if they're doing their job and doing it as well and as consistently and doing it that way all the time, then we make room for them. Is there Thank somebody you. over there? Yep. I was next. Excuse me. Thank you. And that's what I was trying to tell you. There we go. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, hi, Howard. Uh, I have a question for you. I am a lover of stories, and I wanted to see, is there a story from all of your 1871 experiences, and I love 1871. I'm I like a million events there. Is there a story that can encapsulate all, like what you've learned and the takeaways you put in here that you can share with us about your adventure there? Uh, is there one story? I, you know, I think that, I think that, um, the story that people always tell back, replay back to me was, uh, one of our guys who had gone away for a week long trip. And when he came back, his door was still there, but I had demoed his entire office because we were expanding into the adjacent space. And so this was sort of an interesting message about how change happens. Um, it was a little awkward for him, but, uh, but it was exciting for us. Uh, Look, I, I think that every day we live sort of different stories. And, and, you know, we were talking before about vocational education. I'll just tell you that, you know, uh, last week we had a plumber at 1871 and he was charging $120 an hour. And I said, Jesus, you know, my doctor doesn't charge that. And he said, you know, when I was a doctor, I didn't charge that either. <laughs> um, and uh, so... So, you know, we live in change. I mean, there are a million things going on. I, I, I think that the things we're proudest about is when kids come and see what's going on. And in particular, the kids have figured out uh, that it's not so cool anymore to be a rock star or a jock. It just doesn't work. You know, the odds are against that. Um, so the new rock stars are entrepreneurs. They really are. And what's helped in that and what gives us the, some hope that school will again be relevant at some point in time is that the entrepreneurs and the jocks all want to be uh, and the rock stars all want to be entrepreneurs as well. So um, teaching kids these skills early on is giving them a future, teaching them to memorize in a, the age of Google, teaching them to sit politely in a room where 25 of them are taught the same stuff at the same pace, ridiculous uh, we have to change that and we have to start with uh, kids in, you know, grammar school and build from there because the old models just aren't getting it done. I'm just going to say, I'm actually a trained teacher. So hearing that just makes me sing. I wish I was a kid that could have come to 1871. So thank you. You're welcome. How's it going, Howard? Good. Good. Thanks. So, you know, I think building a diverse team is very important. You know, engineers, marketing, sales, all kind of different types of people. How do you convey the vision of a company to people with vastly different mindsets and really communicate that idea to, to the whole team? Because you know, everyone I, thinks I, differently. I think that, well, the first thing you have to do is that you have to understand that people don't listen. And so you have to say it a thousand times. You have to say it till your face falls off, actually. And being obsessive and not being embarrassed about how important that vision is is the first order of business. If you aren't willing to sign up to do it literally every single day for the rest of your life, then it's not going to happen. Um, but the other thing is that uh, it's the job of the, the leader to fashion the vision so it works for each of those people. Because each of those people is looking for something in their careers, in their lives, and you need to make it possible for them to be successful and see they can be successful in whatever their dreams are. I mean, their dreams may be different things. And they also have to understand that uh, to enable them to sort of pursue their dreams, they also have to take care of business. They have to sort of be productive in doing that. But, you know, we have people from every conceivable, uh, you know, walk of life. I mean, I remember... Uh, you know, we hired the guy that was running the short order grill across the street from 1871 because we thought nobody worked harder than he did. So he now, I mean, this is four years on. He's now married. He's got a kid. 
And every day he comes in, you know, he reminds me that, you know, we found him in front of the grill because the three of us were sitting there saying, boy, this guy works like a banshee, you know. And now he's responsible for some of the stuff that goes on at 1871. So you find people, you find talent anywhere. What you want to do is make them a part of the dream. That's really the story. Sir, any, or lady, whoever. Hi. Um, thank you so much sure. for um, speaking. But also I appreciate that how thoughtful 1871 is about inclusion. Now all of us can't work at 1871. How do we take on inclusion individually? How would you prescribe bringing that to your own company? It's not comfortable work. It's um, it's not it's not comfortable work, and also it's risky because not everything works out. Right. And so um, I think that you just have to. It doesn't happen if you don't try. And I think that's the bottom line. I mean, we try to make room for. People, some of those uh, folks are going to be successful and super, and some are not. Um, you have to, you can't let sort of mediocrity persist. This is the hardest thing. Um, you know, in big companies, the most scary thing is that they, because survival isn't existential, because they're always going to be around, they let mediocre uh, projects persist. They let mediocre people hang around. Startups can't afford that luxury. So you have to be a little more aggressive, but you also have to understand that it takes people different amounts of time to understand these new cultures and the way things work. It takes people different amounts of time to understand that you don't have a four wall office, you know, that you're in an open space and how do you manage your time in different ways? So, but I think that you, um, it's not easy work, as you said, but I think if you don't do it, um, we're not going to be successful because a lot of what goes on um, is stuff that we're learning is better in a diverse group. You know, one of the interesting things about airbags is they killed a lot of women and children in the early days. Why? Because the model for airbags was a five foot nine male and it worked for that model. But if you were littler or smaller, when it exploded, it literally killed you. So what happened was, and how was that designed? It was designed because there were no women in the room. Uh, the early speaker phones couldn't hear the women in the room because their tones and the way they were designed didn't pick up different sort of treble layers. It was crazy. So we can't think of an instance where a diverse group isn't going to be additive to understanding the full dimensions of how you deliver products today that also address a very diverse population. Thank you. Sir. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for uh, speaking with us. Um, just a quick question. Pardon me. Um, you've obviously had the luxury of starting 1871 from the ground up and implementing your vision and your culture um, from the get-go. Uh, do you have any words of advice for implementing some cultural changes to an already established? Sure. Well, entity? look, I've, I've been doing this for 50 years and I did a school uh, called Kendall College, which had been around for 75 years, and picked it up and moved it downtown to Goose Island. And that was completely transformational. I mean, it was this far from being bankrupt. And I remember, talk about a story, I remember the first day I showed up, the faculty said, we need new marketing materials. And I said, that's a little bit like lipstick on a pig. You know, I mean, how about if we fix the school first and then we invite more people to come here? So uh, part two of that was here's a culinary school principally with a volleyball team. And I said, maybe those 300 pound chefs aren't the best at volleyball. So we, so there were a lot of things that went into that process. One was to focus on the critical issues. Two was to get the spectators off the field. Three was to prune the thing to get it down to what was really important to the future. Uh, four was to be really honest with the people as to what was gonna be required of them. Uh, it's a whole process. I can refer you to some articles we've written about change management, which is different from startup management. Uh, but the biggest thing was uh, a level of sort of honesty that was telling people that it was going to be hard, but it was going to be really important and letting them decide if they were up for the job and up for the trip. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.